don't need to labor if you can't plant the exactly. crop to begin with, I guess. In fact, uh, Mr. Nassif and I have a member that is sitting here in the room today, which I noticed when he entered into this cold hearing chamber, the temperature went up by about 50 degrees because he is uh, uh, very vocal. He runs a large uh, harvesting company, and he uh, has said to me, and I'm sure he said to Tom, hey, you don't have to worry about clean water. You don't have to worry about clean air. You don't have to worry about food safety because you're not going to have laborers and workers to harvest the product when it needs to be harvested. This is huge. In fact, uh, we annually survey our membership on the issues of, of most concern to them. And farm labor avail availability, just standing on its own, ranks uh, number two or three. Uh, and just this, this specific issue. So yes, we have to have uh, a, a temporary guest worker program. We need ag jobs, but agriculture needs it. We, we employ people that perform work that Americans, American citizens just will not do. They have refused, despite opportunities to in, engage in that kind of work, and they won't do it. So we absolutely need a temporary guest worker program here. If we don't get it, and we've got to e-verify, we're really in trouble. So can I, so e-verify without immigration reform is going to do you under? Yeah, I would, it would have dire consequences. I think one of the things that you need to consider here, too, is that that workforce that will be legal and available will be under an inflationary situation because growers are going to compete for those workers, and whoever pays the highest wage is going to get that legal worker. So you're going to see rapid wage inflation also, which adds to the cost of the product. You know, today it was all over the news before I came to the hearing this morning that McDonald's is going to hire 50,000 people, most of whom will make 8.35 an hour. Uh, are we to presume that uh, you could compete favorably against McDonald's, assuming somebody wanted to work as badly uh, picking strawberries as flipping burgers? We do. Their wages are better. That's what I'm trying to get to. I'm, yeah, I didn't I think anyone was going to be shy here about that. And, and a lot of them give health care. And uh, I mean, I'm very, very impressed with uh, Mr. Murray. You're a teenager, and I was a, growing up in, in our family farm. Those hot days, long days in the field, you know, it was our, part of my culture. It's part of what I've grown up in. But boy, it, if some of those days, if I could have been working in the McDonald's, <laughs> talking to the girls or whatever, it would. It, it was, there was a lot of draw there, and and you know, I, I when I came into farming. It was about 1985 or so, and a couple years after that, we had the uh, saw worker program. Right. And I, I really thought the country was kind of going in the right direction, because previously I heard about, in, in my dad and my grandfather's past, about you know these immigration raids and the Bracero program and having to uh, go and find workers in downtown LA. And, and, um, and so in, when I was a young farmer just starting out and this program was enacted, I said, wow, maybe you know, our country's really starting to get on the right track here and feeling more legitimate. And you know, that kind of faded away. And most of the workers that we worked aggressively to sign up went into other industry um, within a couple of years, you know, whenever that, when, within two or three years. And ever since that time, it's, been, it's very difficult as, a, as an American farmer especially in specialty crops, is to feel that our country has is legitimizing us as growers, providing, you know, growing the food for this country. And we really need to um, look at that in a, in a very serious manner of, of legitimizing the American farmer. Because if E-Verify did hit, um, without us already having an active, successful program, you would see a crash. And, and uh, so it's not simultaneous. I, I, I understand what Jim was skinned to, but it, it has to be working before <laughs> that happens. Uh, Mark, if I can follow up with you on just one thing. If, if you were, because you mentioned this in your statement just now, if you were to have a workforce that we said, okay, this workforce will do it and they can come here and stay here, 
if I heard you right, one of the challenges is in three years they would move on to other jobs or five years. That one of the real challenges for agriculture, particularly the specialty crops where they're highly labor intensive, it's not highly automated, uh, like tomatoes, strawberries and the like, is that basically what you need is a workforce that will choose to do that and that workforce disproportionately lies to our south. These are places in which those jobs are very desirable. They will come here, they will do the work, the return home annually. That's really what you saw as legal uh, some years ago that disappeared. Many of the people that worked for my family for many years, even generations, have, have stated to me that if there was an, a legitimate program where they could um, you know, work here with opportunity, but then return home to their, their, you know, their own farms and their own towns, um, they would very much appreciate that. And so I think there just has to be a, a program um, that addresses the agricultural economy and, and, and you know, in our country, food, food production. But it's, it's also, there's, there's labor forces is different in this valley than it is in the San Joaquin Valley where you raise fruits and nuts and they, they when the trees, uh, when the fruit's there, you, you pick it. Sure, once a year versus and you move, you know, perpetual. From the, you start in the south and move north and end up in Washington picking apples. In this valley, particularly in the strawberry, you pick a strawberry, what, every four days, the same plant? Every three days. The three same days. Plant. So you have the same workforce working for you in the same fields um, year round. Uh, there's different types of labor intensity when you're planting and harvesting, and but that goes on for uh, eight months here. And you know, when I was stationed here, I used here. to watch the they're radishes go in, grow, go in, grow, and pretty soon I realized they they grew pretty quick. <laughs> but <laughs> it's it's a different. It's not a migratory workforce, so it's really stationary and in this area. And we we need to you know it's it's much more than just guest worker. It's also the other things that go along with being you part need a of perpetual a community. temporary worker here. Well, I'm not sure that they're temporary. I wouldn't think that any of these growers would tell you that their workers are, are kind of uh, you know uh, waiting around for a job. These people, they know them. They're involved. These are, as one of the growers said to me, you know, they're like family members. I, I go to their quinceañeras. I help their kids go to college. Um, it's 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 a it's a it's a workforce they're very familiar with. Well, I guess the question, and this was one of the challenges we face when we try to deal with it from Washington, is the kids they, are they going to work for you after they get out of college? No. Where do you get your next generation of people to do, perform these jobs? Uh, and that's that's really one of the challenges. Uh, Sam came 20 years ago. I came 10 years ago. What what can the federal government give you? in the way of relief that would take care of this problem on an ongoing basis and not a one time as we did in 1986 that was fully ready to be another one time by the early 90s. It's not unlike the discussion we were having about environmental issues. There's some science there and there's some facts in the labor deal and I, I disagree with Jim just a little bit and say that it's not that people in our culture won't do this job it's that people in our economy don't have to. And so what drives people to come from Mexico or Central America to work in our agricultural areas is the opportunity. It's economic. And, and that economic difference is, it's, it's science. I mean, it's fact. It's not going to change. And uh, I, have, I have virtually 100% of my permanent employees are American citizens. They weren't when they got here. Their kids are going to college. They're not going to come back and be farm workers. Then they've, they have come to the land of opportunity. They've experienced the American dream. Uh, and, and certainly not all of them, but enough of them so that you continue to need to have people who see that there's an economic opportunity. Ag jobs, I mean, the, the thing that fascinated me about that is you had the far right and the far left and UFW and Farm Bureau in one room. Just what Sam was saying. Bring everybody into one room and work out something that everybody can live with. We have it. Ag jobs. Now, that to me is a, it's a, it's the kind of thing we've been trying to figure out all day about how to do how to do things with EPA, how to do things with government. We have a labor solution which is a, a license to be here and go home 
and you contribute to the American economy, you support our ag economy, and, and to a large degree, you don't become a burden on it. What portion, if we were to have a bill that provided for a guest worker program that came here, received, if you will, I use this word in parentheses, prevailing wage, because I want to leave that decision for later, uh, could not remain here permanently, must go home at least uh, annually, must renew their ability to come back year after year, and had no inherent pathway to citizenship in the basic bill. If we were, if Sam and I were to author that as an ag jobs bill, with those basic provisions, what percentage of your problem would that kind of a system take care of? 10 percent, 50 percent, 90 percent, 99 percent? And we'll presume for a moment that nobody's opted out of it, that uh, to a certain extent, because this is one of my passions, is if someone's been here under a broken system and they're willing to go into a fixed system, we should not say, no, we've got to go get some third party that's never been here. So we'll presume for a moment we're talking in many cases about the same workforce that E-Verify stands looming in front of uh, elimination. Mr. Nassif. As an old ag labor lawyer for many years, uh, and having I was just telling Sam, you've been out of being an ag labor <laughs> lawyer for a long time. Now you're pulling yourself back in. Yeah, you know, I don't have any choice with this immigration reform with this 2 a unfortunately, and now, now card check here in California. Uh, certainly something like that would work for agriculture. The problem has always been, well, how do you get both sides of the aisle to agree on a solution? We got the UFW to agree on ag jobs, or they got us to agree because we all gave a little bit. And what the UFW wanted was a pathway to citizenship. And what we wanted was some other protections because we needed the workforce, whether they had a path to citizenship or not. That's a completely different and separate issue. But assuming that a bill like yours could pass, you know, that would solve most of our problems for our workforce. But the <clears throat> thing we need to make sure everybody understands, and I've been preaching this for a long time, is agriculture is for secure borders. We are for workplace enforcement. We are for employer sanctions. We are for E-Verify. All we ask is that before you implement something like E-Verify and employer sanctions, you give us a basic method of bringing a legal workforce to the United States. Whether that's a guest worker program, whether that's ag jobs, whether it's some permutation. Between those, it doesn't really matter as long as we have that. But for the House of Representatives, to push an E-Verify bill for every industry with no understanding or, or desire to understand that agriculture is completely different. You know, we're only 10% of probably all the illegals in the country, and yet everybody thinks it's all ag. Well, 90% of it is all these other industries that use these illegal laborers. All ag wants to do is just take into consideration the fact that we ask unemployed Americans to do the work. And we don't get any response from unemployed Americans. So the law provides us the ability to go out and get foreign. But then you take that law, the H-2A, that we have, and you have the Department of Labor, which has no desire to see that a successful program, that wants to make it as difficult as possible for us to get these people, who is refusing H-2A applications in record numbers and trying to make it expensive, then the only federal solution we now have doesn't work. And now we're looking at an E-Verify on a national basis that will destroy agriculture. I mean, our farmers will go abroad. There's no question about it. We're already doing that, going to many foreign countries and producing. So all of that takes jobs away from this economy. And instead of producing the multiplier effect of maybe two to three jobs for every farm worker job in this country, they're going elsewhere and producing two to three jobs in a foreign economy. Let me, Why would we want to do can that? Can you follow up a little bit more on that? I mean, it, sure. it, it, it's, as one of the growers said, there's no uh, labor, sh labor shortage in Mexico. Right. So I, if I just go grow there, all my, most of my problems are solved. Um, what have you, and you're really seeing a trend in this, of more people investing in, in, in particularly in, in northern Mexico? And I have a large uh, avocado producing member, and I, and probably one of the largest in the country, if not the largest, who said that 80% of his avocados were grown 
in California and 20% abroad. And now 20% of them are grown in California and 80% of them are grown abroad. Now this doesn't mean that there aren't problems trying to farm in Mexico because they have labor problems too and labor unions and families who will shut down a complete operation if they have a wedding to go to, uh, things you might not have happen uh, on this side of the border. So they I have call that problems. family values gone amok. <laughs> <laughs> that's called the family leave program, I yeah. guess. <laughs> But, but yes, that's what's happening. There's no question. The transition is we're moving more and more of our production out of uh, the United States into foreign countries, which means we're moving those jobs to the same places. Mr. Murray, I saw your head shaking, yes. Uh, would you say that, putting it in, in Ambassador Nassif's way of saying it, reform H-2A so that it works and you can do what you need to do from a standpoint of labor? Yeah, I'm not saying that. Just well, right but here. I mean, you said you said they gave you H2A and it doesn't work. It doesn't work, but you see, H2A gives us about two percent, and I testified at your right. committee hearing. It only gives us about two percent because it's so difficult and so expensive, and because of the requirement for housing. If you reformed H2A in a meaningful way, it would still be difficult to get the workers because it's awfully difficult to run all of those people through consulates in Mexico and to try and get all of that done and get people here. There's a much simpler way to do it through a guest worker program. And as you know, the union doesn't want the H-2A to work because if H-2A really worked, then they wouldn't get the ag jobs, which is what the union really wants, is to bring these people in and make citizens. Anyway, I don't mean to be yes, sir. Well, yeah. uh, when Mark. I, when I, yeah, and, and I apologize for calling it H2A reform because maybe that's too much of a stretch, but I was referring to what yeah, the ambassador was saying. It's hard to believe you could reform that one enough. Uh, when we hear H2A, it, it just, you know, we get the hair. They're so soured out. on it. Yeah, it, it's pretty difficult to uh, feel there's any um, uh, way out with that one. It, it, it's so onerous um, that uh, many growers uh, and take so much expertise and, and for the return, for the value, it, it just doesn't, it, it's not worth engaging in. So we need cl a clear guest worker program. And you know, it's a, interesting, I, I've traveled to Spain because Spain's another large strawberry growing area. And in the past, um, you would go out to these fields and uh, you would actually see, I don't know, you know no, no offense, but blonde haired ladies picking strawberries everywhere. And it was just amazing to me. I was like, well, what, what's going on with this? And and they go, well, oh, these ladies are from Pola, Poland or Romania. And they had this guest worker program that brought in over 100,000 people a year to pick strawberries. And um, the interesting thing, though, I just had my, some Spanish visitors come visit me. With the unemployment rate so high in Spain, and especially in some of these towns, they say up to 30% unemployment, 15 to 30% unemployment. Um, things have changed again. And the reason why it's changed is when, when Poland got admitted to the EU and now there's a legitimate way for those ladies now to go into the northern European countries and get jobs in different industries. The strawberry picking has become, you know, not as desirable again or, or agricultural jobs have not become desirable once you've, you've had a program that allowed them, you know, um, free um, you know, free will to go wherever and because they're part of the European community now. So now you have, it took extreme unemployment, maybe 30 percent, for people to actually start to filter back in to uh, agree to start picking strawberries again. And that's, for the Spanish guys that have, have relayed this to me, it, you know, they go, wow, it took that much to make it happen. But it, ha it has to be specific and it has to be nimble. And that's when it, that's what, um, in was very uh, inspiring to me that some some way they were able to put in a nimble program to be able to bring in the guest workers to ha to to pick these perishable crops. We cannot engage in something that maybe you're going to be um, having 30 to 40 people um, um, successfully applied and entered into a program in a couple months. Agriculture doesn't work that way. I mean, we have set nature sets our de deadlines and we're we're going we're going and if you don't the crops are rotting in the field so it has to be a nimble program well the uh, uh, the Europeans have a kind of an interesting common sense one that 
they do essentially have open borders as do, though we as we do between the states. I think the difference in the European Union with the new Eastern European members is you have essentially a Mexico economy that is now part, not completely, but part of it. So there's a natural economic migration that goes on. And just like I think you said earlier, uh, those people do not come to Spain for the most part to stay in Spain or even to Ireland. They come in order to earn money. They save at a higher rate. And they, they are part of why Eastern Europe is also seeing a huge amount of investment with people that have earned money overseas and now are investing in their, uh, their home countries. This is one of our problems. We've done a very good job in our 50 states. So there is no such equivalent. Our equivalent is not part of the United States, but in fact, Guatemala, Mexico, Ecuador, a number of other countries, and econo economic refugees that we all see on our streets every day. Now you'll see in Spain, uh, if you travel there recently, the, the uh, agricultural workforce is made up of many migrants from northern Africa, since, since the, the Eastern European countries have joined the community. Yeah. Sam, other well, closing comments well, yeah, here? I, I, I think your hearing, the purpose of this hearing is, uh, you know, under your oversight and government reform, is to look at what impedes job creation. And it's interesting how we started off on, on EPA regulations and then it ended up on uh, immigration issues. That's why we did it last. You never get off once you start. But, but I think there's there's another but there's another message that we forgot to talk about here, and that is uh, what I'm concerned about is that it, look, these laws that we've created, not only we, the federal government, and the and all of the regulatory process that comes out of that, but the state government and even local government. If we're going to just cut the EPA like mad, without being careful about how you approach it. And I know your party has been really, uh, leadership has been, let's sort of gut the EPA. You're never going to be able to reach uh, Ambassador Nassif's comment about it, then have a consultatory process because there won't be anybody to consult with. So the laws, the laws are going to be there and who's going to win in this? Are the lawyers in the suit? Because the courts aren't going to they're going to enforce the law. And you say, well, I went to the agency and there was nobody there. The doors were locked. Nobody answered the phone. I couldn't get my permit. Uh, so, I, you know, that's why this process and you're having these oversight hearings is got to look into this stuff. I'm, I'm, I hate bureaucracy. Uh, I hate it when I, you know, you have to wait in line to get an answer and you spend a whole day at it. But how do you, how do you reform it in a way that's, it's a not a meat axe approach that really gets to the bottom of the problem here. And I, and I, and I think that you've heard that it's going to take some bold leadership to require, I like the idea of having a, maybe a, a, a one stop uh, in the federal regulatory process. The EPA is the one that you've suggested. That's sort of, the, that's its role, isn't it? And, uh, and hopefully you and I can get some support to do this Ag Jobs Bill because I think it's so crucial to the well-being of our community here. Living, having, you know, I, I expect that 70% of the workforce here is not properly documented. Uh, but that's workforce that also has kids in school. That's workforce that also spends their money in this community and tries to find housing in, in this community. So it's, it's a big social issue. And to have, have that much of your workforce kind of living in a dark cloud of, of fear uh, that any moment you may be deported, uh, it just is a bad way to operate a community and certainly a bad way to try to govern uh, an a, a complicated agriculture practice, a labor-intensive practice. So I appreciate having these hearings. I hope we can make some good out of it when we get back to Washington. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sam. Uh, in closing, uh, we are the Oversight Space Space and Reform Committee. And although our oversight includes a huge amount of investigations at any given time, probably 30 investigations of misconduct, waste, fraud, and abuse in government, it is in fact the reform portion of our mandate that brought us here today. We wanted to listen to you about not only problems you face, uh, but also how you view the possibilities of reform. We're not here to write legislation. Our committee has an interesting jurisdiction. We can look at it all. 
we can write it all, we get what they call sequential referral, but in almost every case we'll be, when we do big reform, we're writing reform that a number of other committees have to uh, process through. So I want to thank you all for your input. Your record you helped make here today is part of how we make the justification for reforms we suggest that other committees write or that in fact our committee initiates and then goes through the process. I want to thank uh, Congressman Farr because when it comes to finding a egg jobs program that works and getting through what is a somewhat failed process post EPA determining that it must start, it has to be done with leaders uh, like Congressman Farr. So I appreciate your being here and uh, I feel very welcome. Uh, I will let uh, your classmate and my wife know that we had a, a good meeting together and this forum is adjourned. Thank you.